Lord, it is a great delight for me. I, I, just, I just feel so privileged in having had this opportunity to be down here with you this week and to have met so many people, had such good conversations, and uh, I, I think that you're very privileged here both to have such an excellent seminary as well as a uh, fine university that is world class in so many regards, and also a wonderful town. You've got the best of all worlds, I think. You've got the resources of a, a university town and the convenience of a small town with excellent restaurants. <laughs> what does that sound for? Is that me or somebody else? Our topic for today is moralizing the biblical text. And I'm using moralizing in both senses of the word, because normally when we use the word moralizing, we use it in a negative sense, to talk about doing something with the biblical text that is not intended. We draw a moral from the text that is not there. That's one use of the word moralizing. Another use of the word moralizing has to do with um, drawing a legitimate moral. And we know that as preachers, we are called to invite our people, to challenge our people to particular kinds of responsible living. The gospel is not proclaimed simply to make people feel good. So there is an inherent conflict in us when we are preaching texts that are not explicitly moral texts. Explicitly moral texts give a, 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 an obvious kind of command. But with texts that aren't explicitly moral, we are still called to, to do something like uh, Calvin's third use of, uh, of the law, ex excite people to obedience in Christian faith. So there's this conflict between not wanting to turn a text into something that it isn't, and at the same time giving moral instruction uh, as to how people should live. We all know that when we preach, we, we want to try and indicate Give people a practical example of what they might do in this coming week to change their lives. <coughs> First, I want to deal with a, a conflict or, or confusion of, uh, of terms. We were talking the other day about exegesis and hermeneutics and homiletics. Uh, and yesterday we were talking about the need for a sermon to be theologically infused with a, a, what we're calling a deep grammar, a deep grammar that can be the foundation for any sermon, but uh, remembering in particular that we're thinking of a sermon that moves from trouble to grace, and we're thinking about trouble or law in two kinds of ways, both the vertical. The vertical is the hardest one for us to hear in these days, partly because we don't like authority, and we always seem to need to challenge anyone who takes a position of authority. And the other one, which is much more accessible and probably is a more constant norm for our preaching, preaching uh, trouble as a mirror of existence, holding up the mirror so people recognize their own lives, telling a narrative of, of, of the depth of trouble that is in people and, and that we are in. And there are similarly two kinds of grace. I was down at Austin Seminary uh, in January, and I learned about a professor, Stuart Curry, who was there, and he was, he was uh, a very noted and much loved professor of the 1970s in particular, and he had a quick wit. He was coming home from one of their football games with Texas A&M, and uh, walking home on the, one of the wide sidewalks coming from the football uh, area. And there was, ahead of them in the crowd in the 1970s, a, a Jesus freak, a hippie who was devoted to Christ and, and uh, was in your face about it. And this Jesus freak, this Jesus freak buttonholed Professor Curry, as he was walking along, and he said, God loves you, and I do too. And Professor Curry, with his quick wit, said, well, at least half of that is good news. 
<laughs> and I, I think that should be the way with our sermons, too. At least half of it should be good news. Substantial pointing to the ways in which God is empowering us to do that which we are called to do. So today I'm going to be working with some other terms, uh, terms like new homiletic, postmodern, post-critical, post-liberal, even post-Christian. We know that we're living in an era that is post-something. We're just trying to figure what it is. And in the fast-paced world we are not, that, that we are living in, we're, it is appropriately characterized as decentered and dispersing. It's a postmodern age that we're living in. The term postmodern is a new term for many of us, but it, it actually came into effect in the late 1940s in the United States with regard to architecture. And it has since been appropriated by various disciplines all across the academic spectrum as a way of identifying the age that we are now in that is past the modern age, past the age of enlightenment. And there are various characteristics that are signature features of the postmodern age. For instance, instead of where the, the modern age was, was united, the postmodern age is, is dispersing, decentered. The postmodern age does not like the modernist concepts of a hierarchy of authority. It likes horizontal notions of authority. The social system is favored in the postmodern age rather than the individual in the system. And interdependence is favored over independence. Communication is favored over information. We call it still the information age, but it's communication. It's the interconnectivity that is valued over and above the, the content. And we know that, that with the internet because it's often garbage in and garbage out. But it's the communication that's valued. The postmodern generally has, been, has exercised a positive influence in terms of our understanding of language theory. I'm still getting feedback on, on this. I'm getting echoes. You're on it? I think they are. The postmodern generally stands out, not for anarchy, because that's how, sometimes how we think of it. We think, well, the postmodern offers us many different kinds of interpretation. In the modern age, we were happy to say that parables had one meaning, even though we knew it even then that scholars could never agree on what that one meaning was. Now we say that parables, biblical texts, have many meanings, and many authentic meanings, and, and indeed even within the Christian sphere, when we're regarding the Bible as scripture, Texts have many meanings, there are many different takes we can take on it, and that's why we can hear sermons from many different people on the same text, and they're different sermons, and they may be all true. So, what has been, uh, what has been changed is that the objective truth claims of modernity have been challenged. We can no longer claim that something is the objective truth. Different kinds of truth have emerged. Is this a better? Okay. Excuse me. Different, a different kind of truth has emerged. Truth and, and what we have to do nowadays is always identify the context from which we are speaking the particular truth. It's not the truth doesn't exist, but the truth is now somewhat conditionalized according to the context and the time frame. These can be very positive influences. In, in fact, the whole emphasis on narrative is largely a postmodern movement. 
We realize that truth can't simply be contained, as, as Hans Brian has pointed out. We can't simply go to the biblical text and, and take out propositions and say, these propositions are equal to what the scripture says. Because the scripture says what it says in its own ways, often with narrative. And it's the narratives that are the meaning, not some, the meanings aren't there as something that can be extracted and, and somehow uh, still preserve the truth. But on the negative side, postmodernity can become an ideology. And it can be inherently destabilizing because it is deconstructive. It takes things apart. And it doesn't have any inherent desire to put things back together again in a, a way that signifies something that is better. It can be anti-communal. And it can impose any kind of foundation for knowledge, especially religious knowledge. And that's its danger. So the challenge of the current age is how we negotiate these competing claims for truth. We can't simply say this is the objective truth. So-and-so says it. It's how we negotiate the competing claims that is the crucial issue. All right. Postmodernism is, is a term, and it, it started to be used in, in homiletics in the last decade or so, but no one's really been too sure what postmodern homiletics is. And I think it's starting to emerge in literature because various people are referring to the new homiletic as, as, as that process which has taken place since 1965. The term new homiletic was first used by David Randolph in the first meeting of the Academy of Homiletics at Princeton Seminary. And he was talking about the new homiletic. Is, is that homiletic that is, is, isn't simply a point form of sermon? It isn't simply structured according to linear logic, but it is rather an event that is taking place, an event of encounter with God rather than information about God. And it is something, he says, that, that draws on experience and that tries to, to give people uh, a reflection of their own lives through narrative and other means. There are different kinds of structures we have seen in the new homiletic. Those structures, for instance, that we looked at on the sheet that was handed out yesterday, we were looking for a particular purpose, and that was the origin of, of a sermon movement that went from trouble to grace. But along the way, we saw uh, Milton Crumb recommending a particular form of sermon that went from situation to complication to resolution. We looked at Eugene Lowry with his, his five stage of, of homiletical loop. We looked at Richard Lisher and, and, uh, and, and Crown talking about the, the ways in which the sermon moves from bondage to liberation or from homelessness to homecoming or, or whatever pairing of, of, of terms we might use for trouble and grace. And we looked at my own four pages of the sermon briefly. All of this is the new homiletic. And there are many other people involved in the same kind of enterprise. Barry and, uh, and the rest of my colleagues are, are deeply into it. The new homiletic is essentially that which then has happened to change our way of preaching within the last few decades. And now, it's, I'm not doing this to confuse you, it's simply a confusing issue. Yeah, I like that sign that was uh, in a women's center some time ago uh, that I saw, it said, if we are having difficulty expressing our thoughts, it's not that we are stupid, it's that our thoughts are complicated. And, and there is a certain degree of complexity within the, with regard to some of how some of these terms are being used. Because the new homiletic was used in the 1960s, and then it wasn't, it wasn't used until about 10 years ago when uh, uh, David Reed started speaking about uh, the new homiletic. So it, but he was using it as a term to describe what had initially been started in the 60s. Well, similarly with postmodern. Postmodern has been used with regard to homiletics only within the last 10 years or so. And now it is being used in the same way that new homiletic is being used. In other words, they're synonyms. 
postmodern homiletics is the homiletics that has taken place since the 1960s. I needed to make that clarification, laborious though it is, in order to be able to talk about a postmodern school in homiletics that is doing precisely the kind of ethics that I think is not appropriate for preaching today. And because it is a significant movement, there are many people who are involved in it. It is important for us to be alert to it, to know what, is, what they are saying, and not to assume that when they use the word postmodern, or indeed Christian, that they're using the same understanding that we might have. And I'm referring to particular members of this school that I'm calling a school. John McClure, who is a Presbyterian, he was at Louisville Seminary and he's now going to Vanderbilt. Joseph M. Webb, Christine M. Smith, Susan Bond, and Lucy Rose. These are the, the main figures that I would identify as part of this postmodern school. It, it, it's not appropriate, they call themselves postmodern, but they are more appropriately called radical postmoderns. That's the term that I will use. It's a term that Christine Smith uses of her own approach. And I think it's not, a, I'm not using it as a way of, of putting down anyone. Indeed, even talking about them, I'm not meaning to stab people behind their backs or speak behind their backs when they are not here. I'm rather trying to engage them and others in a conversation about the significance of what they are doing. A number of features of the radical postmodern contribution to homiletics, because it is specifically dedicated to this issue that we're talking about today, how do we use ethics in preaching? The radical postmodern school is completely dedicated to including the person who is on the outside. That is their primary ethical claim, and it's a good claim. Include the outsider. That's what Jesus did in his ministry. The radical postmodern school raises timely, important issues, but its solutions consistently raise more problems than they answer. And here are some of the claims of the radical postmodern school. And I would say that these claims are, are probably, these are specific to homiletics, but the, some of these claims are also more general, having to do with what postmodern theology is also saying. First, the radical postmodernists seek to avoid hierarchy in preaching. So Lucy Rose has a book called The Round Table Pulpit. John McClure has a book called Collaborative Preaching. Lucy Rose, in her Round Table Pulpit, sought to avoid hierarchy in preaching by, by recommending that what would happen in the congregation is, is that they would rotate the preacher through the congregational members with the preacher being, having oversight of that preaching. That was a way of, of reducing the hierarchy that she perceived that existed between the ordained and the lay people in the church. And, and I'm not quite sure that that kind of simple rotation is actually going to remove the distinction between 
Done by um, Neiman and uh, Ted Rogers. Uh, I've forgotten the title of the book at the moment. Something to do with collaborative preaching. What they're suggesting, they, they did some research, particularly among congregations that have an ethnic, uh, a wide ethnic diversity. And they're recommending that in those kinds of congregations, it's very important for a pastor to meet with the representative groups all together and to have the input so that the preaching is speaking to the diverse cultural backgrounds and stories and histories that people are bringing. So there is some evidence that that can be a very authentic and important approach. However, this emphasis on uh, seeking to avoid the hierarchy in preaching is certainly one of the dominant emphases in the radical postmodernists. The, a second emphasis in the radical postmodernists is that they are radically for the marginalized, as I said before. Preaching undergoes, is undergoing a deconstruction of its common authorities, namely the Bible, tradition, experience, and reason. Those are the four authorities that preaching traditionally is uh, drawing upon. And, and in the radical postmodern movement, there's a welcoming of the deconstruction of each of these. For John McClure, he, he, he views this as a, a process of the church being critically and ethically open and renewable. So there's a, a in fact, what he identifies is two different motions that are happening, uh, happening within the church in relationship to, to the Bible. There is an identification, we've always known this in the modern age, that there is an identity that is formed by scripture, that we read scripture and, and we hear it proclaimed and our identi a certain identity is given to us, the identity of Jesus Christ. Um, and we find our own individual calling in relationship to that identity. And then, in addition to this center of fugal, identity, there is in the postmodern age a centripetal identity. Uh, that, in, in other words, we're, we're on this circle and, and we're being what he's saying also casts us out from our individual identities so that we have to explore new identity, new challenges. And I think it, it's an appropriate kind of metaphor to think that, that yes, we are drawn in, but we are also drawn out having to search a new way of understanding. We, in other words, we always have to be calling into question in this postmodern age our most valued and treasured assumptions to see whether we have substituted a cultural value for the value of the gospel. His understanding is at least a half adequate view of scripture. Since his approach deals fundamentally with loving our neighbor, but he leaves almost entirely loving God out of the equation. He nonetheless makes an important ethical claim. The church, he says, has not allowed the voices of many people to be heard that need to be heard, the disenfranchised, women, the poor, people with differing abilities, gays and lesbians, he says that we must be wise to the other. And so he calls his, pre his book on preaching, Other Wise Preaching. It's radically dedicated to the marginalized. And that is the uh, a primary thrust of the radical postmodernists. A third feature of the radical postmodernists is that they deny transcendence. For them, they don't like the word truth because it seems to indicate objective <coughs> truth that the modernists held. And they would rather have other words instead of truth, words like wager, I would wager, working hypothesis, practice, testimonial affirmation, Meaning and truth in their system is a result of one's social location and ways of knowing. In other words, we are socially conditioned to view certain things, and those become our truths. There are not greater truths that exist, and all of language exists as a kind of a, a closed system. 
We can only know what our language enables us to speak. We cannot know that which our language doesn't reach. We think with our ideas. Our ideas are words. Beyond the words, we have nothing. So they're saying that all of everything that we know is confined to the language system. And what that means is that there is no transcendence. The reason they don't speak about God in significant ways is because for them language is a closed system and as soon as we speak about God, other than people's, what people might say about God, as soon as we speak about God as a larger truth, they're saying that we're violating the basic principle of language. Were preachers to move in that direction, we would never be able to dispense what Gerhard Forday and Richard Jensen speak of as proclamation. Proclamation is first and second person direct declarative speech of God in the sermon. You are forgiven. I love you. You need to change. That kind of direct declarative statement would never be allowed because it is coming from elsewhere. A fourth feature of the radical postmodernists is that they represent a theology from below, generally to the exclusion of the theology from above. Christine M. Smith holds a particularly negative worldview in her book, Preaching as Weeping, Confession, and Resistance. Radical responses to radical evil. I know it doesn't sound like a very peppy title, but it's also representing a very negative worldview. She says that the radical evil is the per pervasive world reality and it dominates, she says, our everyday life. Radical evil is the pervasive world reality and it dominates everyday life. Her risking the terror Resurrection in This Life is the title of her most recent book. And it is deep in compassion for those who are excluded, but it's also an extension of this negative perspective. From my, from my own understanding, as preachers, we are called to have a positive worldview. No matter how bad things are, we are a people of hope. And we proclaim the hope loudly, boldly. And no matter how bad things are, we would still want to say that God's blessing on creation at the beginning as good still remains. Christine Smith and her own talking about the resurrection, resurrection in this life, indicates plainly that resurrection is not something that God does, but it's something that we do. This is where the danger comes in the postmodern era, when people start using the traditional terms in, in non-traditional ways. We read them and we think they're saying the same thing, but they are not. Resurrection for her is something that we do. Listen to, to what she says. She says, the act of remembering resurrects people, creates energy, vision, and life to change the present and helps us live differently in the future. John McClure does not limit God in precisely the same ways, but he avoids talk about God. And either way, theology from below encourages an anthropocentric homiletics, focusing on what humanity must ethically do, and an anthropocentric homiletics can only produce anthropocentric preaching. Preaching that focuses on humanity. And one final feature of this post-radical, postmodern school. For Smith, Bond, and Webb, theology is reduced to mere metaphor. Theology is mere metaphor. Joseph M. Webb has a book called Preaching and the challenge of pluralism, and he's using pluralism as the larger term for postmodernism. Preaching and the challenge of pluralism. And he counsels that 
We do not need to get upset when someone denies our hub symbols like Christ is divine. Rather, he says, what we need to do is realize that, in fact, our belief in the divinity of Christ has been socially conditioned. And if we could go back to the social conditions under which we, we came to that understanding, perhaps in a Sunday school class uh, over years with a particular teacher that we, we appreciated, then we will be able to explain, understand how we came to that understanding and appreciate how somebody else comes to a different understanding. In other words, we believe what we believe because we are conditioned to believe it. In his view, the Bible is not gospel in any metaphysical sense, he says. Rather, it is the Christian church's charter, its mythic foundational document. He says, it is not historically true, nor was it ever designed to be in its various bits and pieces. Webb would reduce the authority of Scripture to our own need for it to be true. We need it to be true because that's what we believe, and that's the authority of it. It's a circular kind of notion. But it's what you're reduced to if your language system is a closed system that doesn't allow transcendence, doesn't allow a higher truth above our language. God is not limited by our language. God can speak to us in, in ways other than our words. God can work miracles in ways that we haven't dreamt. Susan Bond has similarly reduced theology to metaphor in her book, Trouble with Jesus, Women, Christology, and Preaching. She understands theology from below to be rooted in the historical Jesus as a human being, about the historical Jesus' teaching and ministry, and not about his relationship with God. Theology from below starts with Jesus, the earthly Jesus, the, the ministry of Jesus, the historical Jesus, and focuses primarily there. It doesn't concern itself with the larger questions. So this is the, these are the kinds of things that she is led to say. She doesn't claim who Jesus is. What she says instead, that here's where you hear the metaphor, taking the, the theological truths that we would claim to be true and, and turning them into metaphor. She doesn't say who Jesus is. She says that Jesus acted like a son of God when he preached and enacted the reign of God. Or, without claiming that Jesus rose from the dead, which she would not say, she says instead, the story of his resurrection teaches us that his ministry of radical hospitality and his way of nonviolence are stronger than the powers of violence. So it's just the story of resurrection. It's not the resurrection itself. The resurrection is just a metaphor for, for nonviolence overcoming violence. Without saying that Christ is risen, she says, the presence of his ministry endures whenever new life emerges from crushing death. Hers is a metaphorical theology, and she thinks that Christology can be salvaged for the people for whom it is now offensive. And her way of salvaging it is to take these religious symbols and, and to split them from their metaphysical meaning, she says. Now, the postmodernists say that we should never have any unexamined authorities. And yet, both Susan Bond and indeed all of the people in the radical postmodern movement are unwilling to critique their own assumptions. They simply invoke their own understandings. Well, I don't believe that what is being offered here in the radical postmodern school is, in fact, a significant advance for preaching even though it is making some important claims along the way, it is raising more questions than it answers.
John McClure is so confident of his radical postmodern ethic for homiletics that he says, even the new homiletic has been left far behind and there seems to be no looking back. And I suspect that homiletics as a discipline has not taken the radical turn that he would want us to take in his otherwise preaching and that it would be other than wise for us to do so. The problem is not the intent, attempt to include the outsider. The problem is largely in doing theology and homiletics by splitting off the divine from the human, the above from below, and without examining one's reasons for doing so. And now I want to make some constructive recommendations for homiletics as a whole that amount to an ethic of homiletics. I'm only going to touch on a few of these. First, I think that how we do homiletics is an ethical matter. And we do need to be engaged in reaching out beyond the church when we preach. Oftentimes, when students pick up a, a text from the epistles and Paul's writing about the church, then, then our, our students, or indeed ourselves, we're, we're tempted to, to write a sermon about the church today. And we need to reach beyond that. We need to be thinking far, far greater thoughts than that. Yes, we can speak to the situation of the church today, but when most people come to church on Sunday, they aren't saying, oh, I wonder, wonder how I can be a more faithful church person. They're rather asking, how can I live the gospel in this kind of world where, where my child is being tempted, where, there's, where there are actions that seem to be immoral at work, and, 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 and I'm not sure sometimes what the truth is. So where a sermon becomes significant is when we take Paul's looking at the conflict in the church and see that same kind of conflict, not just in our church, but in the larger world, and then, that would be the end of page two, then bring in the gospel to say what truth we might have, what, what hope we might find in Jesus Christ for living out in the larger world. So homiletics is fundamentally an ethical matter and needs to be, needs to be concerned with ethics and needs to be leading our people to lives that are morally and spiritually responsible. Second, homiletics needs to arise out of actual sermons, out of excellent sermons, and it needs to lead to excellent sermons. The radical postmodern school that I've just pointed to, with one exception, Joseph Webb, every one of those books that I have named does not arise out of a sermon. There are no sermons that are indicated that are, are, are the, the benefit of this theory. The theories are never tested in excellent sermons. If, if, homiletic, if homileticians always held their theory up to actual sermons to see if they would work, we would have far less of the poor theory that exists out there today. Thirdly, homiletics is realistic in its interpretation of the church. Lenora Tubbs Tisdale recommended that theology in a sermon be seriously imaginable within a local context. And I think that's a nice phrase. When, when we preach in, in our, the theology of our sermons needs to be seriously imaginable. It can't be something fantastic, wild, that we've drawn out of nowhere. It has to be applicable to this particular situation. And I think that the same kind of, of claim is necessary for preaching, for homiletics as well. It has to be seriously imaginable. Few churches would tolerate for long a preacher who proclaims at a funeral, Jesus is a good metaphor of our hope. Or at Easter, it is as though Jesus rose from the dead. As both Bond and Webb seem to encourage. Or, as Webb would say, if it helps, we can think of Jesus as risen from the dead. Moreover, few churches would tolerate for long a a preacher who is so other-focused, so focused on those people who aren't here, that there's no good news for the people who are. Fourth, homiletics is interdisciplinary. It mediates between other disciplines and preaching practice. And this makes it prone to adopt whatever ide ideology serves it, be, from, be it from historical critical method, 
non-referential language theory, that's what they're saying, there is no reference beyond the, the language, there is no truth beyond it. Non-referential language theory, splitting off the divine from the human, or the reduction of God to a scientific worldview, or the privileging of homiletical theory over practice, or whatever. Even justice can become an ideology without appropriate scrutiny. And it's the lack of appropriate scrutiny that is the problem with these radical postmodernists. Not everyone who is marginalized by history or society is a victim. Some are oppressors, some are pimps, some are drug pushers, some are pedophiles, sociopaths. And there needs to be some mechanism in our theology for distinguishing between those who are authentically called marginalized, and, and it is a justice issue, and those who are not. Moreover, as Charles Bartow says, while God indeed may be on the side of the poor and the marginalized, God may not be there always as the poor themselves suppose. The definition of holy justice, the definition of holy justice finally remains with the word of God. Well, because homiletics serves preaching, homiletics is conservative in relationship to tradition, and I would say it's radical in relationship to the gospel. The gospel is radical. And that's where the radicality of homiletics should come from. Not from some kind of wild discernment of a new theory and adoption of it because it may have some potential. So, in, in line with my own understanding that preaching needs to be, or homiletics needs to be practical, I want to turn in these closing minutes to some practical questions about ethics. I think that the approach of the radical postmodernists is uh, one ethical approach, but it is not the one to be taken. And here I consider first how grace and ethics seem to be in conflict. You know, when we look back on the history of preaching, even with great social justice proclaimers like John Wesley, can scour their sermons and there's almost no reference to social justice in their preaching. It's almost as though, it's almost as though the people were so um, aware of the social justice acts that were being done in the name of the church that they didn't have to speak about them in, in the sermon. Or it's almost as though grace and ethical commitment are at odds. If, if, if you introduce too much discussion of social justice, then there's no room for the grace of God to be proclaimed. Moreover, in many of our sermons, if, if we were to preach an ethical sermon on a social justice issue, many of us would find that, well, there's a greater subtlety to the argument than we have time to research for this Sunday, or that, than our congregation is willing to listen to. Our congregation might want a simple answer, should we do this or should we not? But the ethical issue demands shades of understanding. So there are lots of reasons why we might not uh, uh, focus on ethical matters as much as we ought to. But we don't have to be looking for those occasions when we preach a social justice sermon. Social justice can be part of every sermon that we preach. And by social justice, I simply mean concern for those who are beyond the church. That righteous, God's righteousness be done. My first suggestion is that the ethical direction for the sermon normally will arise from the biblical text itself. If we're preaching on ethics, we need to use texts that correspond as closely as possible to the ethical issue at hand. We can't be using some figurative text and saying that this actually is what the Bible is saying about this particular matter. Our ancestors had a moral sense of scripture. They claimed that every text spoke to how we should live. 
And while many of the moral meanings our ancestors had prior to the Reformation, while many of those meanings seem to be allegorical or, or often applied to texts and aren't authentic meanings that come from them, they nonetheless point to a reality that is true for us today. We still invoke a moral sense of scripture, even though we don't talk about it, every time we suggest what people might do in their lives. We're getting that discernment from the text and we're now making it as a venture for, for individuals. The moral can be an action of love, perhaps taking a meal to a shut-in or visiting someone in hospital. Even telling a story about someone visiting a hospital can be a ministry to the social justice issue, can be meeting an ethical responsibility in preaching even though that may not be the point of the story. The moral sense often requires that we look beyond the particular words of the text for a larger theological meaning. It's often the, the theological reading of the text that will give us the moral implication. Let me give you an example. Proverb. Proverbs 11.25 is an obvious moral text. It says, A generous person will be enriched, and one who gives water will get water. Well, if we took that text at a simply literal level, a generous person will be enriched, the one who gives water will get water, it could simply be a formula for getting rich. Be generous, and if you give water, you're going to get water. But that isn't the moral implication of the text. If we read it theologically, we'll go to other verses beyond. And in verse 28, it says, Those who trust in their riches will wither. Verse 30 says, The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And both of these suggest that verse 25 implies a different kind of wealth. Thus, in terms of faith, in terms of faith, a generous person does become rich. Obtaining the tree of life. So even preaching a moral from a text requires a theological interpretation, a larger interpretation of the text. We can see the same thing if we take a text like, The Lord loves a generous giver. We could preach that text at the literal level and say, that's what it means, we're just supposed to be generous. But at a theological level, we then ask, well, what's the significance of this in relationship to God? And when we ask that question, we realize that the only one who is the perfect giver is God in Jesus Christ. And when we've realized that it's only God who is the perfect giver, then we can also say that it's God who becomes poor on our account. And we cannot become poor if we are rich in our relationship with God and our neighbors. The moral of the text comes from the theological understanding of the text. The moral sense often requires looking for a moral when it is not obvious. For instance, in the miracle stories, they obviously point to Jesus' authority and power. But let's take the example of the healing of the paralytic who was lowered through the ceiling in, in Mark 2. Even in that, which is about Jesus' healing, a moral can be discerned. Be as faithful as these friends of the paralytic who lowered this man down, expecting that he would receive a blessing. Or, another legitimate moral from that text is, be more moral than the crowd outside who wouldn't let them near. We wouldn't say that that is at the heart of the text, but it is a legitimate moral meaning that arises out of it. 
Another way to consider ethics and texts concerns the fact that individuals in the Bible, like in our stories, invariably represent certain values. We hear a story and we attach moral values to the people. It's the same way in the Bible. Further, the church understands from the earliest times that biblical texts have a plurality of meanings and are meant to have a plurality of meanings. So, for instance, in, um, if we take Jesus Christ as a moral example in our own preaching, this, uh, this involves portraying Christ's action with sufficient detail that it is identified or experienced as exemplary, whether or not the preacher intends explicit moral focus. Now, sometimes the moral is to the side of the text. For instance, when Jesus responds to the lepers who call out in Luke 17, they call out for healing. Few people would claim that Jesus is kind is the thrust of the text. He stops and he heals. But it's not Jesus' kindness that is the main focus of the text, we would say in faith. It's his authority. He has the authority to heal whom he will heal. Nonetheless, even though it is to the side, one would still say that Jesus' compassion for those who are suffering is every bit a part of his journey to the cross. It is a side moral of the text that I would say is a legitimate one from it. Sometimes a moral is invert, in, inferred from Jesus' words. For instance, about stewardship in the parable of the lost coin. There are obvious dangers in drawing a moral from Christ's example. Without historical criticism, we are unable to distinguish between a legitimate ethic implied in Christ's behavior and one that we import to scripture from our own setting and culture. For instance, uh, we might th think that Jesus uh, uh, is nice to the lepers or is, is polite, and that's not a moral to be drawn from the biblical text. That's our own culture reading into something in the text. But if we find a moral in Christ's every action, on what base do, basis do we deny a moral in awkward texts? For instance, Christ overturning the tables in, in the temple is not an imitation of something that we would want people to imitate. We wouldn't look at that text and say that there's a moral for us in that. The meaning of the text is, do not defile the holy. When he condemns the fig tree out of season, we don't want people, farmers, to go swearing at their fields. That's not the moral. He is the one who has authority even over what will grow. His command to tear out your own eye rather than sin speaks against judging others. It's not a recommendation for something that we're supposed to do. Nonetheless, there are legitimate morals to be drawn from his actions and his words. And I'm conscious that our, our time is drawing short. He delays two days in responding to Lazarus' illness. And what he's saying through that, a religion but more, is that our agenda is not God's agenda. He condemns the scribes and the Pharisees against presuming self-righteousness. And there's a moral implied in that for us. He commends the dishonest steward and speaks about the need for Christ's followers to be shrewd 
So I am saying that ethics is an important dimension of our preaching. It can be a conflicted, we can be in a conflicted situation when we are imposing an ethic that isn't there, but there often is a legitimate ethic. And the ethic can be found if we theologize the text, discover what God is doing, because once we have a focus on what God is doing, which is, as I suggested, the starting place for all of our sermons, as soon as we read the text, ask, what is God doing in or behind this text? Once we know what God is doing, then we know what our action might also be. Because we are to live our lives in imitation of Christ in the best sense. Please don't run too far <coughs> uh, this week. There is so much to chew on, to think about. I've learned a fair amount through what you have shared, and I know that the rest of us have too. And I suspect there will be a number of tapes that will go on sale. And just double the price, and Barry, you and I can work on the profits later. <coughs> I think that will be very useful uh, to us. But uh, uh, again, we are grateful that we had uh, such an erudite uh, and informative uh, collection of lectures on not only preaching but on thought. It was, I appreciated that we went beyond just the, the actual putting together of a sermon and we talked about what was implied within it. And so we are so grateful for that. And uh, again, I'm going to have to go back and change some sermons of mine as a result, which I, I hesitate to do because they worked so well before. You know, <laughs> I appreciated so much uh, the call for integrity in Christian preaching, also that came through loud and clear. Uh, Paul, uh, we wanted to give you just a little token of appreciation. <coughs> uh, Dr. Morrison has a much larger token he will give you later of our appreciation. But this is, uh, first of all, <coughs> uh, when you get back into the Ontario area, a little tie uh, of Acadia University to remember your time with us. It doesn't say Acadia loud and clear, so you might get by wearing it somewhere in the Toronto area. And just a mug uh, for coffee or tea or whatever you choose to put in it. It says Acadia Divinity College that expresses our <coughs> deep appreciation for you taking the time to come here and to share with us. So uh, I think I can say on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. God bless you. before he sees Dr. Morrison for something else along the way. But again, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, express our appreciation. Thank you.